I, I, uh, can I ask you something about it? Goes back a ways. You started to make Queen Christina, the rumor has it, with Greta Garbo, and yet we all know that the finished film did not have you in it. Is that, is there anything embarrassing connected with that? Mm, not now. Be? It was at the time very embarrassing. But um, what happened? What happened was that I started working with Garbo, and I just didn't measure up. I wasn't good enough for her. I was, what, 25 years old? That's no excuse. I mean, one could be quite good at 25. But she was an absolute master of her trade. And she was uh, a great figure. She had an enormous image mm -hmm. to the public. And me, I was just groveling like a puppy dog in front of her. And I, I wasn't the way to play her great lover. And um, it, it became apparent. It was apparent to me, really. I wasn't really surprised when I was fired. But she had to fire me because there was nothing else to do. I simply wasn't up to her. Was it embarrassing for you? Was oh, terribly awful? embarrassing. I mean, well, yeah. to have yes. to come back home and say, well, I was oh, sacked. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Thank God I had an engagement in New York that took about six months, and that sort of helped, too, um, as a protection. <laughs> There's another question I have from that period. Uh, women have always said to me that uh, as a young man, you were the handsomest man they have ever seen, and as a middle-aged man, you are still the handsomest man they've ever seen. Yes. And yet there's a story that a director named uh, Sam Goldwyn uh, d <laughs> didn't agree, and I, I want to confirm that with the source. Yes, yes. Well, I had a, a, a perfectly loathsome disease called athlete's foot. It is uh, politely known as tinea. Right. But I caught it in the, during the making of Wuthering Heights. I caught it from a second-hand pair of clogs, which came from Western wardrobes. And in one of the films, I was dancing, one of the scenes, I was dancing down a hillside in meant to be Yorkshire through great pots of heath about four foot high. You know, the heather in Yorkshire is about six inches high, but however, that doesn't supposed to matter. And I was dancing down with Merle Oberon for about two days, and I caught this terrible thing from this horrible pair of clogs. Well, um, I was in great agony with it. It was terribly painful that my foot looked like an American football. It was so big. And... Uh, I had to have x-ray treatment on it, and uh, one day, I had been just making close-ups the way you do when you can't walk about for any reason in the film, uh, on, a, on a, a, school, a stool, that, um, a revolving stool. And I'd been finished all the close-ups I could do, and Sam Goldwyn came onto the set and started talking to the great director, William Wyler. And uh, started talking to him, and I thought, if I sneak past him quietly and limp a lot, He'll put his hand out onto my shoulder and say, Willie, you must send this poor chap home. I mean, he's obviously terribly tired, and he's obviously in great pain. Be a good man and send him home. So I sort of limped towards him as well as I was able to. And, I, and sure enough, he did put his hand on my shoulder. And he turned to me and he turned to Willie and said, Willie, if this actor goes on playing the way he is, I close up the picture. Will you look at that actor's ugly face? It's dirty, he's acting stagey, and he's hammy, and it's awful. I will not have him in my picture any longer. Tell him to wake up or I'll... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly right. <laughs> a few days later, I'd finished the scene where uh, Heathcliff puts his hand through the window, which was sugar, of course, in my case, but, the, but my hand was very carefully made up with undertaker's wax and gashes and blood put in all over the place. And I was standing outside the kitchen door, waiting for Flora Robson, who was playing um, Ellen, to open the door to me. And sure enough, Goldwyn came and sat just there. And uh, I was sulking by this time. I was very mad with Goldwyn. And uh, he'd obviously been told, you've hurt that young fellow's feelings. Now, you didn't have to go that far, Sam. Now, come on, make yourself pleasant to him, for Christ's sake. Otherwise, we'll never get the picture finished. And there he was, and there was somebody else sitting by. And I was uh, standing around, and I gave him a look. And he leant forward and said, how are you? And so I went. <laughs> and he said, uh, it's very bad, isn't it, Andrew? It's very painful. I said, I know, I know, it's very painful. Athletical feet. <laughs> oh, to be able to do an American accent, be able to do Sam Goldwyn, that is really, uh, that's really insane. Are there any films of yours that you would like to destroy? Um, <laughs> is there anything but way back there that you don't like to see when it comes on The Late Show? I think the first film I made for which I had any respect was Wuthering Heights, probably. And then there was Rebecca, Not which the was also... Ticket. Oh, that was a long time ago. I, um, I can't really remember that. I know there is that was one of three pictures that took me two years to make in Hollywood. I was under contract for, uh, with RKO for two years. And I made one with Adolphe Monjou and Lily D'Amita 
and Eric von Stroheim called Friends and Lovers. Then I made one with uh, Elissa Landy and Lionel Barrymore called The Yellow Ticket. It had to be called The Yellow Passport because The Yellow Ticket meant something dirty and they, we couldn't have that in those days at all. It's quite different now. Mm -hmm. And then I made another one with um, Anne Harding called Westward Passage and it was an unfortunate viewing of that film that got me the part with Garbo and uh, my trouble started. But after Wuthering Heights, <laughs> I respected the medium very much. Uh, it was Weiler, really, who, who made me believe. I didn't believe that Shakespeare could be done on the films. And he made me believe he could do anything on the films if you just found the right way to do it. He inspired me, really. It wasn't very pleasant to work with, but he was a marvelous man to talk to. There's a question actors have asked me to ask you. You played Macbeth early in your career in mm. theater, mm. and it was not successful. Hard to believe that you ever got bad reviews, but you yourself have referred to it as a, a, yes, as a disaster. Well, then later you played Macbeth and had great success with it. What happened in the interval? Well, these are great parts. They're, they're marvelous conceptions of Shakespeare's. They're, all you can do is to try to reach them. If you're a young man, I think I was 27 when I did it first, you can't. It isn't that you haven't got enough technique or that you haven't got enough voice or that you haven't got enough emotion or enough know-how or anything. It is that... Um, you haven't really got enough experience of life. And by the time I did it the second time, I think I was about 48, and I, I had filled in a lot in the way of experience of acting, of course, naturally enough, in all that time. But the, my greatest friend was the things that life itself had taught me. And, and there are certain parts that demand more experience of life, just as they demand more experience of acting. Mm -hmm. Do you hate to be drawn into discussions about whether acting is from the inside or the outside? Um... You come well, in I once on your never side. make up my mind. I know I'm supposed to be a highly, possibly too much of a technical actor. Um, but uh, I think that it is a technical job. And I think if you do it right, nobody suspects that it's a technical job. I think it's the, you need a bit of the art that conceals art in order to do it well. Perhaps I don't do that part of it well enough. I hope I do. I don't feel technical. I feel every minute of Long Day's Journey in London. I feel desperately, deeply, emotionally, the parts that I'm playing. Uh, and, I, of course, I adore the funny ones, because I'd rather make people laugh than make them cry. But it seems to be my lot to do the other. But I like, um, on the whole, I like the idea of acting better than I like acting itself. Mm -hmm. I've now, perhaps it's age or something. I'm 65, and it may be a little bit uh, asking a lot of the nerves. To, to sort of go on playing huge, huge, huge parts. Right now you're playing one of the hugest you've played. Uh, yes, it's a very long part. Yeah, yeah. But it's a marvelous piece of work. It's wonderful. And of course, one of the great joys in it is trying to, trying to uh, bridge the Atlantic and make it convincing to the Americans and the audience because our yes. accents, we pride ourselves on getting just right. We did um, work very hard. We had a brilliant American author, Donald Rogdon Stewart, who knew the American accent of the period of 1912, which the play is. So we worked very hard on it, and we were very strictly schooled. I, I think we're not too much to be ashamed of. Enough. I'm going to see it in a few nights. Well, now, don't be unusually nervous that night. <laughs> I'll try not. Okay. <laughs>